Awesome. We are added in and now we are live with our Stride for the Love of Running webinar series. Today is, uh, I keep checking my phone when we go on so I can get a proper date. It's Wednesday, April 22nd. I believe it's Earth Day today. So um, I've seen all over social media people saying uh, happy Earth Day. So happy Earth Day to everybody. Uh, today we're joined by Justin and Jeannie Metzler. How are you doing today, guys? Good. Yeah, we're having a good day so far. Awesome. It uh, it looks a little stormy out right now, but I'm I'm sure it'll uh, brighten up a little bit later. But we're really excited to talk to you guys today. Um, first, uh, before we get into things, I want to let everybody know if they have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat. Producer Gus behind the scenes will send them along. I already saw uh, before we started the stream a couple people queuing up in the chat saying uh, hello to everybody. So uh, we're going to have a great Great show today. Uh, we're going to talk specifically um, to you guys uh, about being professional, uh, you know, athletes and having to deal with the current situation at hand and kind of how uh, things uh, adapt and how things have to be kind of switched. Uh, first, can you give us a little bit of an introduction about yourselves? Uh, Justin, why don't you start? And then uh, Jeannie, we can uh, talk about uh, an introduction for, for you as well. But uh, just tell us a little bit more about yourself, guys. Sure. Yeah. Well, my name is Justin Metzler. Um, I'm 26 years old. Uh, I'm American. I grew up in Chicago, but uh, I live here in Boulder, Colorado. I've been here for six years, and that's where I met Jeannie. And uh, now we got married last year, and we're starting to build a little life together here in Colorado. And uh, yeah, I'm a professional triathlete and uh, kind of high performance coach, I like to call myself. So I've got a stable of 10 athletes that I coach. Um, in addition to my racing, but kind of my main focus is trying to get out there and do the races. So uh, in the past, I've focused on 70.3, which is half Ironman, and started to transition into full Ironman with dreams of trying to perform at uh, the World Championship events, both half and full Ironman. Awesome. And then Jeannie, what about yourself? Um, so I'm Jeannie Seymour. <clears throat> I haven't changed my name just yet. It's got delayed with all the COVID stuff, but I'm right. going to do that soon. Um, I'm originally from Johannesburg in South Africa. I um, kind of left home when I was 20 to come over to the States. I got an opportunity to train with a, a coach from South Africa, and I just kind of fell in love with the lifestyle and um, really had a dream of pursuing my career as a professional athlete. So mm -hmm. I kind of didn't look back, and I've been here for almost seven years now this is where i met justin and um, yeah we got married last year and here we are just um trying to progress and um yeah like i've also transitioned into the, uh, the full ironman distance i wasn't focusing on more of the 70.3 but um yeah definitely transitioning into the longer distances and um trying to you know i did corona last year but i i would like to to go back there and um Kind of um have another opportunity to race there so mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> for for both you guys why boulder colorado um well i mean like i said the first time i came here just mm -hmm. um from the lifestyle point of view it's just really safe like coming from south africa i i wasn't really allowed to to go outside mm -hmm. by myself it wasn't really safe so just to be in an environment where i could ride my bike and run and kind of be free was was really awesome mm -hmm. when yeah you have the mountains and just kind of like um so many triathletes from from all over the world come here, especially during the summer, and mm -hmm. uh, like get to rub shoulders with the best in the world. So that's kind of a, a great place to be if you want to do triathlon. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And then what, what about yourself, Justin? You said uh, Chicago originally, but uh, Chicago very different than Boulder in a couple ways. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I was definitely a Mid Midwest boy growing up, and I went to college uh, in Iowa, so University mm -hmm. of Iowa, so pretty close to home there. And uh, yeah, I had about a year there where I was, where I was living outside the back of my Jeep um, mm -hmm. and just sort of like driving around, training wherever I could and sleeping on couches where I could. And I just got the opportunity um, to go sleep on someone's couch in Boulder. And uh, the guy said, hey, this is the place you got to be. Um, and I just came and sort of never left. I think uh, my background is in physiology. So being here and thinking about the high performance aspects of training in a place like this mm -hmm. is uh, that's sort of the first draw for me. Just because this, I'm trying to take this pretty seriously, and I don't think there's anywhere else in the U.S. that's as good to train for professional triathlon as there is Boulder, just in terms of any sort of session you can think of, mm -hmm. have access to those facilities here, whether it's climbing up 
a mountain or riding flat time trial routes, great running trails, technical, non-technical, anything you want, you've got here. Um, and then as Jeannie alluded to, uh, yeah, just the inspiration from all the other athletes that are here as well. It's sort of like every, all the athletes congregate from all over the world to train here. Um, and particularly with the crew, the group that I'm training with now, you know, we've got some of the best people in the world kind of working mm-hmm. together. And that's, uh, that's the only, one of the only ways in my opinion that you can kind of, uh, you know, get access to that high level. Of- yeah, absolutely. I always think it's amazing if you're out for a, you know, a casual jog around the res and you just see somebody it's like, Oh, yep. They have this many, uh, you know, medals and up oh, there, this record setter and stuff. So great place to be. Uh, so I want to uh, give a little bit about your uh, accolades and then talk about what we're going to talk about uh, today. So Justin, uh, the bio here says you're a 70.3 and Ironman professional athlete. So for both of you, um, I guess maybe could you define very quickly what that means specifically? We've talked to a bunch of people, you know, in the triathlon and running world, but for somebody that's a runner and it's kind of heard uh, oh, you know, 70.3 or, you know, full Ironman, they might not know what that exactly entails. So could you tell us uh, before we dive into what you guys are doing specifically what that is? Sure. Yeah. So Ironman triathlon is sort of where everything starts. And I think both of Jeannie and I's goals sort of start at um, start at Ironman and work backwards from there. You know, what things sort of more of a career arc and you can't, these Ironman races are really long for us. They take anywhere between eight, nine hours. So um, an Ironman triathlon is 2.4 mile swim, 112 mile bike, and then a 26.2 mile marathon run to finish. And a half Ironman is just half of all of those distances. Mm-hmm. Um, so no matter what, we sort of consider this long course racing. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, they're pretty grueling and tough events because no matter what, you're looking at over uh, over three and a half hours of racing, no matter what race we're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I, I feel like people see, um, you know, maybe their friends say they're training for an Ironman or a half Ironman and, and doing that stuff. So it's definitely becoming more and more popular. Uh, and especially right now, as people maybe are relegated to being indoors and they find themselves picking up a bike, they're saying, oh, like I might be interested in something like this uh, a little bit later on. So um, we're, we're going to love to hear more info about it. Uh, so, Justin, uh, the bio we have says you were USA Triathlon's Rookie of the Year in 2014, and you have over 30 top five finishes in your professional career, including three wins. And then, Jeannie, you're a nine-time Ironman 70.3 champion and competed as a professional in the Ironman World Championships, like you mentioned, Kona, and looking forward to uh, returning there. Uh, I know we always uh, have a couple people there, and they're always so pumped to be in Kona, you know, for being on the beaches. With, what's it? Uh, Waikiki Boulevard, uh, I think. So it's a really, really cool event. Uh, today, we're going to talk about how you guys are racing virtually and all the benefits that virtual races have offered you, how your normal training routine changes, and what you've learned from these changing training routines, and how your goals have changed. So um, first up, Virtual racing. This is something that we have seen from a couple people like in the stride community doing their own 5Ks, 10Ks, half marathons, marathons, uh, you know, people doing the, uh, I don't know if you saw the ultra marathon, that backyard ultra marathon where people run those four mile loops every hour. So people are doing tons of crazy stuff uh, for you guys, because you're multi-sport athletes, you have maybe different access to different races. So how does virtual racing uh, come into your game plan now that it is something that you can do? Uh, and how does that kind of fit in your training schedule? Uh, well, I think we'll both touch on that, I guess. Um, yeah. We kind of got the opportunity to be in the first round of Ironman put on the virtual racing Um kind of for, I think it's mostly for the age groupers, but we kind of were on display. Um, So I feel like we were the guinea pigs of that weekend because it was kind of hard, like um, almost like the system ran a bit slower. But yeah, I mean, it was still a solid effort. So in terms of getting an opportunity to race, say like that weekend, Justin was meant to be in Oceanside. I was Mm -hmm. in Texas. So we were kind of fit already, so I think it was just an opportunity for us to put in like a race simulation kind of effort. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it was just fun to push hard, I guess. And 
I think what I got out of that was kind of inspiring people all around the world to still try and keep active during this time, even though it's really challenging, even if you can't get outside, um, maybe try and do stuff indoors. So that's what I took from it. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that races are still continuing virtually, even like on Swift, what Justin did today. Um, but he can touch on that. It's like still a super hard effort. And mm -hmm. I don't see that being like an every week thing for us because mm -hmm we honestly don't know when we're going to race. So we kind of need to like keep some of our stores for like, if there's right. opportunities to actually race later in the year. Right. Yeah, for sure. I think like the virtual racing scene is important right now. And I think it's going to become a more integral part of what everyone does moving forward. We don't know when this pandemic is going to slow down. We don't know when racing is going to resume. So I think we all have to kind of lean into the virtual side of things this year and mm -hmm. I think everyone should take advantage of the opportunities that are out there. Ironman's got their virtual club where you can be doing um, triathlon type duathlons almost mm -hmm. every weekend, all different sorts of durations from beginner to expert. Mm -hmm. um, and then you've also got tons of options for cycling in terms of the Zwift world mm -hmm. and for everything in between. Everyone's doing their like own pop-up virtual challenges. Strava's got their challenges going on. Like these are all amazing things. And at the end of the day, if you, I think we all love to train, but mm -hmm. there's nothing uh, that can replace the effort from racing. And of course, these things aren't exactly racing themselves. They're not that same sort of uh, endorphin rush competitiveness that you get out on like an Ironman course or a 70.3 course or mm -hmm. your local 5K or 10K. But there is an air of that. And I think for all of us to keep that spark alive, um, it's important to just keep those things in the program. So, yeah, like I think it's a great thing. You have to take some of the results and some of the outputs with a grain of salt. But um, it's, an, it's an amazing opportunity to push yourself and uh, make sure that you still have that, that competitive fire. Burn. Yeah, absolutely. How does uh, the, the kind of change in training go for a more virtual focus? So obviously, if you're um, you know, practicing the bike, you can get indoors on the trainer. Or you can still go outside if your you know, government regulations allow for you to be outside. Uh, how does that kind of change now with a, a bigger focus so obviously like you mentioned it's not something that's going to go away next week is it something that you guys are kind of changing your mentality about and you mentioned leaning into it but is it something that uh is kind of going to change for the very near future for you i, I don't think so um I, when all this started to happen i think Jeannie and i both sat down with our respective coaching staffs and said hey look like our main objective here is still to win ironman and ironman 70.3 races whether the timeline for that is pushed out a couple months or even a year, that goal doesn't change. The intermediate goals of having these virtual races are amazing, but I don't think either of us are tailoring our training programs to specifically prepare or get ready for those. I, a great example is today I did uh, the Swift pro race, the second pro race that they're having. And last night I did like an eight mile hard tempo run. So I'm not tapering for these things in the same way that you would like an Ironman 70.3. Um, but I still raced as hard as I could today. It's sort of just more of a contextual thing and saying, hey, this is something fun. It's something to get up for in the morning and, and get a little jittery about, uh, less so focused on like, hey, this race actually is important. And I think, I think a big thing for us as professionals is the financial component. Like some of these events don't have a financial piece. And so you only have so many uh, matches to burn throughout the year. And we're not going to waste those on ones without any uh, financial uh, reward. So yeah, we're sort of trying to find the balance between having fun, doing the virtual races, but also saving it for when it actually counts. Yeah, absolutely. Jeannie, you mentioned that uh, Justin was supposed to be in Oceanside and you were going to be racing in Texas. Is that right? Yes. So uh, yeah. yeah, how does uh, that play in so obviously traveling for a race so uh the boston marathon was supposed to be earlier this week and that attracts you know thousands of runners from all across the globe and these races that you guys typically do require a lot of travel do you feel like there's uh you know a difference in the stress that you maybe accumulate having to travel and you know ship your bike and you know fly with that uh and get in that new area versus the comfort of staying at home is that kind of like a trade-off you guys are um, seeing where you don't necessarily have to travel right now so you can kind of focus on that training for the big, big races down the road? 
yeah, definitely. I mean, staying at home and just kind of being grounded is is a good place to be, especially to get in some good hard work um, for training. And yeah, it's definitely less stressful in terms of traveling and like wearing down your immune system and going to all different kinds of places and being exposed to all different kinds of things. Um, but it's it's hard because we love racing and um, we love traveling to places around the world and it's worth it to us because that this is what we love to do right um but this is what we have right now so i mean yeah it's um, actually less stressful financially too not to be traveling all over the world but yeah we we miss racing <laughs> what are some of the most interesting places you guys have been for races? Because obviously, if you're doing these huge international events, you get to go to super cool places and you get to experience things. Uh, you know, somebody that's normally used to doing their neighborhood 5K might not be used to doing. But what are the coolest places you've gotten to travel? Uh, we've been so many places. Yeah, that, that's like a, a definite perk of the job Just description. <laughs> Yeah, I would not have been of a tear. I think like in my early, early 20s, like I really sort of was striking that balance between like pursuing high level sport, but also like just traveling like a person in the early 20s might be um, inclined to do. And so, yeah, I went all over. I spent six weeks in Scandinavia. I've been down to Brazil. We've gone to Colombia. We've been to Iceland twice. Um, Iceland was probably our favorite place to go. On. Yeah, yeah. We, we had an amazing experience in Iceland. We actually both ended up winning the race. I think that like that helped our um, our view, but also just like an aesthetically beautiful, yeah. beautiful place. But yeah, we've been we've been all over the world. So uh, Jeannie's actually almost out of passport pages. So <laughs> if that's any indication of where we're at. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's probably yeah a good indication that you've been well traveled, and it's a very good thing that you get to call that your job. I think too. So it's it's very very cool. Um, we have a couple questions uh, that we want to ask before we go to the next set topic, and I'll remind anybody watching live that you can absolutely ask any questions you have, uh, and producer Gus will send them along. Uh, first question is no access to a pool, and I'm near freezing water uh, temperatures in a northern climate. Is there any swimming training alternatives that you might be able to recommend? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, I think people are thinking about the swim component in a bunch of different ways. We're doing everything that we can, and a big component of that is actually buying some like resistance bands, strapping those on a wall or a door frame, and then um, I, for myself, for all of my athletes, and then my coaches are putting together like pretty elaborate, um, not super long, but like engaging swim cord routines. And I think that's an amazing way to still maintain that uh, technique, develop the power. Um, and swim cores were something that I was incorporating in my training even before all of this happened. And I, I thought that was like a great way to develop awesome technique, see out of the water what you're doing with your arms, um, and develop that, that strength in the, in the primary muscles that you need for swimming. So we're really leaning into that. Um, and then also just doing all the strength training and mobility that we can here at the house. I think some people are saying, Hey, look, I'm just going to push it off and not waste my time with that stuff and rather just focus on the bike and run. But I still think there are gains to be made, or at least um, you can go into some sort of maintenance mode with doing whatever you can. What does, uh, just following off of this, because I'm curious, what does swim training actually look like for you guys? And does that differ from uh, maybe doing the short course stuff versus all the way training for, you know, goal race uh, at, at the world championships? Well, um, I, I think we've kind of tried everything. We've been through phases where we did a super overload of swimming where honestly, like, I think we just both got really tired from that. So I think if you, we, for us, we've just found a place where we get to like between 20 and 25 Ks. Um, and most of those sessions need to be super high quality, especially the main sets. And then it's just kind of maintaining your swim. And I think that kind of, sets you up well for both 70.3 and Ironman. Um, just except for like, I think for the Ironman, like some longer intervals are definitely needed in terms of just being prepared for rest day and that, that longer event. And then um, what's been key for us is doing as much open water swimming as we can, like once a week, like that's just been huge. Like just the aspect of sighting and just being used to being in a wetsuit, like that's just really important. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think uh, we talk about this all the time, and I think 
a lot of people are inclined if they have a swim limiter to say, I'm going to overload my swimming and try and do, if you're just a regular athlete trying to prepare for a race and swim is your weakness. Um, number one, most people, the swim, at, at least for triathlon, is the, the smallest component of someone's race when you're looking at overall time. Even if you're, a, let's say, a relatively weak swimmer, and let's say you're in the range of 90 minutes to two hours for a 2.4 mile swim, the race itself is going to be 10, 11, 12 hours. So you have way more time to gain when it comes to focusing on your bike position, aerobic conditioning on the bike, run efficiency, run economy. Like those are kind of more low hanging fruit than the swim. And I think over time you can see progressions on the swim. Like instead of rep, instead of doing one year where you're doing 30 K a week, you're better off doing 10 K a week for five years in a row. That's where you're going to see the gains. I think that's what Jeannie and I did. Neither one of us came from like a specific swim background, but we're like Jeannie was fifth out the water in Kona this year. Um, she's an incredible swimmer. And that just came from, and myself kind of in the same category, like I'm typically at the front of the race. Like we've just swum 20 K every week for 10 years. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> And that's what it takes. Like it's just being super consistent with it. Obviously this is the biggest break we've ever had off from swimming. Um, but I think like, because of that consistency, we've, consistency we've built up over the years, like, I don't think we're going to miss too much of a beat when we get back in the water. Yeah. And I think that um, just to add to that, I think that's also one of the biggest benefits of being here in Boulder, having access to all the swim groups, like Justin and I have been with so many coaches from Jane Scott, Dave Scott, um, Judy Dibbins has just been a huge impact on our swimming and also getting to swim with people that are a lot faster than you. I mean, that's just been huge for us to just like be around people that are better than you. Like that's just given us a huge boost in the water. So yeah, we're pretty lucky with our swimming. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I was going to ask too, uh, if you do add any open water stuff, cause um, you know, I'll swim occasionally or do aqua jogging, like in a pool at a Boulder rec center. Right. Uh, and that's intimidating enough coming from a strictly, strictly running background. I can't uh, necessarily imagine practicing, you know, diving into the open water, but I imagine that's that crucial thing that kind of sets apart race day for, for you guys is just being able to be kind of kind of used to that. For sure. Thing. So um, we do have uh, one kind of follow-up question. Uh, this comes from Dan and it's related to swimming. You guys mentioned that you are having your longest break from swimming and you're doing, uh, you know, the, the cord exercises and different things to focus on the technique. Have you tried, uh, and I, we talked about this with Bobby McGee, he was our second um, webinar guest, uh, the VASA swim trainer. Do you have any thoughts on the VASA or VASA swim trainer? Yeah, I actually have one of my athletes who has one. So I've been prescribing that for him all the time. I think it's it's sort of in the same vein as the swim cords. I think you can sort of get the same stimulus with just buying some, you know, $40, $50 resistance bands. I don't know what those bosses run, but I know they're more expensive than that. So, I mean, if you have unlimited access to funds, then that's a great tool to have. Um, but I don't think it's necessarily something that's compulsory right now. Um, yeah, I just think it's a good tool like a lot of other things. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and then one last question from Jim for this uh, portion of the question and answer. Uh, and I might be wrong with the pronunciation, but it's Ruvi, R-O-U-V-Y, is that correct? Uh, with Ruvi as the official bike virtual training platform for Ironman, will Ironman do virtual races in Ruvi? They have the Boulder Ironman course as a VR video. Do you guys have any thoughts or experience with that? Yeah, yeah, Jeannie commented on it a little bit earlier. Like. Um, we, the, the Ironman virtual club is essentially, yes, Ruby has officially partnered with Ironman when it comes to their uh, virtual racing platform, but, uh, Ironman's virtual club, all you have to do is complete the distances that are part of the club. So for example, this weekend is a 3k run, a 40k bike and a 10k run. The 40k bike can be completed on Ruby, Zwift. You can do it outside. You can, whatever. It doesn't matter. As long as you complete the 40k, the software recognizes it as completed distance, you're good to go. Um, we've done both. I raced the first weekend of the Ironman VR on, which was mand mandatory for us to race it on Ruby. And then today, like I did the, the men's pro try version two, uh, Zwift race. And yeah, I think like both have their advantages. Like Zwift is an amazing platform, a reliable platform, one that a lot of people really like and enjoy. Um, Ruby, I think is a little bit more new to people. The functionality of it was decent, but I think they still have some kinks to work out. So, um, yeah, I would just say now's a great time. I think a lot of us have time and um, to try all these things out, and I think we can get free trials for all of them. So just give each a shot and uh, see what you think. Yeah, absolutely. Just try everything if you can, right? 
Yeah. Yeah. And just to add to that, I mean, what's the difference between Ruby and Swift? Like, what's a cool aspect of Ruby is you actually get to see the course virtually. Like, they actually go ahead and film the entire course before you get to write it. So you're actually seeing what we would be seeing if we went outside here and rode in Boulder. Whereas sure. Swift is just like kind of a yeah, it's like a gameplay, gameplay virtual, world. virtual world. So that's that was kind of a cool thing to to be on the course, especially knowing Boulder as well as we do. So yeah. And that was uh, that's one of the things that we've had past guests talk about is that visualization and practicing those mental skills. So if your goal race is you know Ironman Boulder, then yeah, sure, you know, practice all that you can if you can't get outside uh, for that. Topic number two. Um, we have here is routines and new training habits. So the first question here is, how has your routine changed? Have you picked up on any new beneficial training habits as a result of a changed routine? Um, well, I don't know if there's been any drastic changes. I mean, sure, we don't go to the pool, so that takes a, a lot of time from, you know, commuting back and forth to our pool. But I mean, I feel like life is a little bit slower pace for us. We we usually get up pretty early and we have places to be at certain times. And now it's more laid back. Like in the morning, we I think we wake up like an hour later, which is huge for us and kind of just like take our time and have our coffee and um, yeah, when we're ready, then we get ready to train and um, I feel like we're more focused during those sessions and a little bit more laid back and I've just been walking my dog a lot more, especially in the afternoons, um, being outside and just like, I don't know, just having a slower paced life outside of training. That's how my <laughs> yeah, I would say definitely my my uh, my routine has followed similarly. Like, yeah, I think all those points are great, and I think all the things are those things are important for everyone right now. I think for for you only have so many weeks or so many days where you can be so full on and so focused. And similar to our points late, uh, earlier when we were talking about training, and you know, you want to be ready at the right time. And I think some of that comes also in terms of your mental focus and your mental acuity and how much effort you're pouring into each session and how much focus. I think now we're sort of, if we're preparing for a big race, you know, you're studying your training program maybe a week in advance, you know exactly where you're going to do it, you know how you're going to do it, you know what time you're going to do it. I think now we sort of wake up in the morning, open up the training, make the plan 10 minutes before, go out and get it done. It's a little bit less serious. The work's still getting done, but um, yeah, I think it's just a little bit less intense and that's important right now. Um, and then at least with my program, the thing that like me and my coaches are really focusing on is we took a step back and said, hey, look, like the realistic situation is that we've got six months at a minimum before we get going again. And like I have some pretty significant, well, I, I feel like we have pretty identifiable things for me at least that are like, hey, here's the, the barrier for you being world class. And so we're taking those, uh, for example, for me, it's my, my aerodynamics on the bike. Like that's my biggest limiter right now. And so I'm doing everything in my power to really try and focus on not necessarily training harder, but just trying to train really smart right now, work on my drills, um, just, just flexibility, basic little things that you might, might get overlooked in like the big scope of like preparing for a big race when you're swimming a ton and you're running a ton. Um, it's just focusing on those tiny details, maybe some run drills, some run technique, like just picking up some some small stuff um, and not necessarily just hammering the training at an aerobic level, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And that was actually going to be our follow-up question here is if you found time to work on any, you know, little problem areas that you might've had in the past, are there any skills that you're practicing more or things that you're finding that you're actually developing more? And if you don't have a big list of them, uh, maybe another follow-up after this would be, uh, what would be a recommendation that you usually see people that are maybe at that age group or just getting into uh, this stuff? What's something that they could use this time to focus on? Yeah, that's that's a great point. And I've like at least I think we're talking about probably a pretty advanced level here. Like Jeannie and I, you know, we've been professional athletes for nearly ten years. Like we've been doing trap on our whole lives. We're looking for sort of like the extra little couple percents. Um, so that's where those aerodynamic drills come in. That's like a pretty advanced thing. Like I picked up drills from the wind tunnel. You know, many people don't even get to the wind tunnel. 
um, you know, running drills. Like I think there's other stuff that you can be doing. So that is um, a little bit more straightforward than that. So at least for my age group athletes who are all very competitive in their own right, like those aren't the things we're necessarily focusing on. We're focusing on um, like running hills. We're focusing on doing the stretch boards, we're focusing on nailing our at home gym routines, uh, typically prescribed by a strength trainer, whether that's um, like the people that I use are Aaron Carson and her EC fit app. And then Kevin Purvis, and he's also another strength coach in Boulder and he's got his thing. Like just following those programs and making those a priority. I read all of my athletes get a note at the beginning of every week with like the keys for the week. And the key number one is always strength, mobility, and core, and then the stretch cords. Um, so I think it doesn't have to be complicated, but if it's just like basic stuff like that, so by the time we get to race season, you've established a strong foundation and a strong core and a good platform to launch from like that. I think that should be the keys right now for everyone. Yeah. And then Jeannie, what about yourself? Have you found that there's any sort of things that, especially if your race distance is very long, obviously, like you guys were mentioning, uh, you don't necessarily have to focus on the swim. If your bike and your run, you can get a lot of benefit from. Is there anything that you find, Jeannie, that you've had time to work on? Well, so it's been actually a good opportunity for me to kind of put in a really big bike block. So kind of just focusing on getting in like some solid work just focusing on my bike without kind of having to swim and I've also reduced my run my mileage quite a bit so I'll be doing that for the next couple of weeks until maybe I can get back to the pool and maybe have an idea of when we will be racing but for now it's like especially with the weather improving it's just going to be really nice to to get outside as much as I can and kind of ride but also saying that I've also kind of struggled in a sense that I have no idea when I'm going to race and I, I get super motivated by races so that kind of drives my training so the past couple of days it's almost like my coach took my training away and he's like okay every morning you're going to wake up and you're going to see how you feel and then let's decide what you feel like doing and then I go outside and I do something and I think that's okay like just knowing that everyone might feel like that sometime is okay because it's like we we run by like you know having a goal and a, a place to be in a race to maybe do and sometimes if things are so uncertain like it can be overwhelming and I certainly get anxious so it's kind of been refreshing to have my coach just like help me take a step back and just take one day at a time until I feel like I'm ready to get back to structure training and just kind of be more harder on myself, if you can say that. So that's where I'm at. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and I actually want to ask you guys too, before we move on to the uh, next set of topics is, Jeannie, you mentioned you're doing a big bike block. I can see some nice bikes uh, behind you guys. Can you tell us what bikes you're using? Um, so I'm sponsored by Ventum. This is my road bike. Mm -hmm. I this is the NS1, so it's pretty sweet with the brakes. I'm just loving that. I just rode in the mountains today. I went up left hand and it's just, yeah, really great for climbing and descending. Um, and then I obviously am on the time trial bike, so. Awesome. Um, and then Justin, what about yourself? Yeah, I'm sponsored by Quintana Roo. So the bikes are actually interesting because Jeannie and I have a lot of uh, sponsors that are congruent. Um, a lot of similar sponsors for a lot of categories, but the bike's one that is actually different. So. Mm -hmm. I'm sponsored by Quintana Roo, and behind me is my road bike as well. I'll get out the way so you guys can see it. <laughs> freshly well. built. Yeah, freshly built. I actually just picked it up yesterday, so I'm oh, pretty wow. excited that. Yeah. <laughs> so that's their new SR5. Um, they actually just launched the road bike this year, so it's pretty exciting for them and me and anyone who's a fan of QR or new bikes or cool bikes. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're on the PR6, which is their kind of flagship time trial bike. And, uh, yeah, with all that aerodynamic stuff I'm doing, like, that's kind of my go-to pick, but to have them go to around Genie in the mountains, that for us is, uh, yeah, as she said, taking a step back, that's, that's something we try to incorporate at least once a week, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. What about, uh, running shoes? Uh, so I know, you know, bikes are that, uh, thing that you have that sponsor and like, that's that one piece of equipment, right? But, uh, typically you have training shoes and racing shoes and that might might differ uh than bikes kind of unless you have like yeah like you mentioned a time trial bike uh what are the running shoes you guys like or if you're sponsored at all um well justin and i both really like nikes so not sponsored sponsored not sponsored cards. but i think 
I did a, I did a race in the four percent like for my first time and I oh they were just like it felt like I was on the clouds you know and I had a really good time too so once I kind of did that I was like oh this is my shoe you know so that's what I'd race in the mall and now I'm in the next percent um and for training I like the zoom fly but Justin I think you like the pig turbo yeah so that's how we kind of differ in training but the racing shoes definitely I'll go to <laughs> yeah yeah I think at this point like Nike's getting so far advanced with their carbon plated shoe that it's almost a disadvantage to not wear them at least in my opinion you know, when I talk about it with my athletes and Jeannie and I have those conversations, you know, we're the first ones to be on the website when a new Nike shoe drops because it number, it's like an aero helmet. You know, everyone out there on an Ironman 70.3 course or an Ironman course, you see them wearing an aero helmet because the advantage is so significant for such a low cost. You know, you can save four or five, six minutes in an Ironman by spending 200 bucks on a helmet. And I think the same goes for that shoe. Um, yeah, for the majority of populations, obviously, uh, some people with mechanical issues or injuries, they're not going to work for, but a big percentage of the population, I think, benefits from that shoe, and that's definitely our selection. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's uh, very interesting, you know, when we're at different expos and we're talking to runners, right? Runners are primarily focused just on that one piece of equipment, but since you guys are doing, you know, multiple sports and training at a serious volume for all of them, you have to come up with, uh, you know, the equipment that works best for your needs. Um, we have one question uh, here so far that's come in. What running metrics are you training with and use to coach your athletes? So Justin, uh, for your athletes, how do you use running metrics differently than cycling uh, power, I, I guess? So uh, if you're recommending any sort of like running analysis uh, and training for your athletes. Yeah, I, I think power has to be used as a tool just like it is on the bike. I think a lot of people get caught up with the bike as the power being the end-all be-all, and I think we've both been stuck in that before. And I think we all have to remember that speed is what we're looking for. And that goes for the bike, and that, that goes for the run. So power is amazing. That is an amazing, heart rate is great, but at the end of the day, we want to go fast. So speed is sort of like my, my go-to. Obviously, when it comes to training and analytics, Power is an important tool, um, but I think speed is where things have to, um, when you're actually looking at results, it has to be speed, not necessarily just power. Yeah, yeah and then, I, yeah, for, your, for yourself. Everything, right, too. <laughs> yeah, I think just having the combination of, um, you know, speed, power, like heart rate, all those things are just great tools to have, but at the end of the day, sometimes it's just important to go out for a run or just go out for a bike ride and just um, go by feel too. Yeah, so. I think for, for me, I'm, at least for myself and for all of my athletes, like I, I'm a real analytical guy. And I think sometimes I'll prescribe stuff like that. Like, hey, just go ride your bike or just go for a run. But I always ask my athletes to have like their power meter on their bike and have their stride on their foot and like make sure that they have their heart rate paired up. And even if it means you're not displaying any of that information, it's important for me as a coach from an analytical perspective to have accurate TSS, which is like your stress for each session. Um, and it's hard to sometimes get that. Um, it's hard to to paint a full picture unless you have that with consistency. So yeah, that's why it's important to number one, always have them on whether or not you're using it or not. And then number two, always have them um, sort of charged up and ready to go. Whether that's your stride, your power meter, heart rate monitor, whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so topic number three we had here uh, is goals. And this is something that you guys kind of alluded to earlier is that you're very, very goal driven. You're looking forward uh, to the opportunity to being able to, to race again. Um, so can you tell us about what goals you're setting for yourself this year and how you might go about actually setting those goals as professional athletes, because for, you know, somebody that's trying to qualify for Boston, they might have that one time that they're shooting for. But obviously if you have a bunch of different races during the season and uh, that maybe one race at the very end that you're really focused on, your goals can differ, but maybe walk us through how you guys set goals and what your goals actually are. Okay. Well, for me, it's, well, it's obviously changed now, but whether I'm racing or not this year, I, a goal of mine is to ride uh, a better time or power for both 70.3 and Ironman. So for me, my focus is focusing on getting getting that power up for both 
those distances. Um, so that's why I'm putting in this block now. And whether I get to see the the actual race results at the end of this year or not, it's still going to be beneficial to put it in right now because I have all this time. Um, I'm just like, yeah, I just ready to race when the opportunity arises. So um, once I get through a couple of bike weeks, I'll, I'll get back to a more balanced program and and be prepared to to race hopefully in August. But I, I really don't know. That might have to get pushed back and, and then we'll just readjust. But that's my goal for now. <laughs> yeah, I, goal setting is it's critical. It's it's uh, yeah, it's it's everything for us as professionals is to work backwards from a goal. And I think it's important to have people in your corner to bounce those ideas off. Like I've got two coaches, Jeannie's got like a, a coach that she works super closely with. And I think you've got to have more than one, particularly in these scenarios. And I think both Jeannie and I sort of have like five year, 10 year overarching goals, what we want to do with our career. And that makes tough times like this sort of a little bit more manageable when you can look at things in the bigger picture. So for example, like, you know, I want to win another 70.3 and I want to win an Ironman. Um, and that's maybe in my three year goal timeline. And I've got things that I need to work on now that are prohibiting me from doing that whenever we get to race again. So um, setting those bigger overarching theme type goals, I think that's where everyone should be right now. And at least that's where I always work back, pandemic or not. Um, it's just setting the, the big goal up top and then sort of working backwards from that. Like what are the intermediate steps we got to take along the way to get there? And then um, yeah, sort of set yourself checkpoints, whether that's for me, getting on the podium at a race or, you know, winning a smaller level 70.3 or something like that. Like those are, those are important steps along the way to get to the big goal, but starting at the top kind of gives you more room for the inevitable um, kind of ebbs and flows in performance that we all have. You know, it's not always a linear progression to the top, you know? Improvement isn't linear for everybody. What are you talking about? No. Uh, I wish it were. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so we had a question here come in from Jim about uh, how are you working with sponsors during this time period in regards to limited racing opportunities? So obviously, again, the fact that you guys are on the professional side, it's it's different because there's a, a career component as well. So um, maybe peel back the layers a little bit on just how uh, you know maybe engaging with with sponsors kind of go if there's a limited time to actually race right now. Yeah, I think we're just <clears throat> we're trying to go above and beyond for our partners in terms of um, just being available. And I think originally when Jeannie and I first started thinking about what how we were going to run our business. Um, we thought it was simply based off performance and we had spoken to some managers and kind of consulted with some people and they told us, Hey, the end all be all is winning. And we trained hard and Jeannie went off and she won a lot and I ended up winning too. And like we got those results, but the, the results aren't the full picture of what a professional athlete's job description is. Like we're here to interact with our communities, um, inspire people to do their thing and be interactive and open to um, open to our audiences and available. So our goal now is to just be like more available at, for content production, um, appearances like this, um, Instagram takeovers, blogs, anything that they need, photos, recipes, workouts, whatever it may be. We're trying to just do like we just have connected with all of our partners. We've got about 10 sponsors who we work with closely. <laughs> Um, and we're just trying to do as much as we can for them. And I think, uh, from what I understand, they're as happy as they ever have been because, um, when we're racing and training and traveling, like they don't have, like, we're not able to give them the sort of access or content production that we're giving them now. So, um, I think it's, yeah, it's a bummer that we're not out there holding and breaking tapes. Like that's great for their brands, but, um, we're also, I think offering them something that all, um, industry partners are hungry for, which is just engagement, you know? <clears throat> Evan, we just, we just we can't hear you for a sec there. Sorry. I, I must've not, uh, must've not unmuted. I, I had a question about how 
you uh, get taught to break the tape because it seems like everybody has that like saunter when you cross the finish line, you pick up the tape, raise it above your head. Um, is that something that you guys practice or are taught? I'll let the expert take that one. No, <laughs> no, it's definitely not something I've practiced. I just think it's a spur of the moment thing and just, yeah, it's a, an incredible feeling. And um, yeah, just, yeah, there's no, no way to describe it. It's just like yeah. pure joy, I think. I think so. You kind of like, yeah, it's not like you're sitting there rehearsing it. Like we don't grab the toilet paper and like have that as the finish line. <laughs> we're, we're not breaking that thing, but I think like you visualize that sometimes and you dream, you know what I mean? And I think we all sort of sometimes lay up at night thinking about what that moment might feel like, particularly like in the days or nights leading up to a big race, like, you know, that what if. Yeah. Um, and yeah, like we work so hard for it. You kind of dream about that moment. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Making yeah. sure I'm I'm not muted too. Yeah. I, I, I yeah. behind you before you. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Sometimes it is someone behind you and you can't just take your time. Right. You know, right. it have like a huge split. But. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Um, I, we had a couple more questions before we wrap up here. Uh, one question regarding workouts. So you mentioned, uh, you know, you're making yourself available to, you know, different platforms and stuff, maybe talking about different workouts. Is there a workout that you're doing now that you would not normally do? So you mentioned that you had already been doing like the core drills and stuff like that, but is there something that you guys have both incorporated that you otherwise wouldn't have and you found it to be kind of a beneficial addition yeah one thing i've been <clears throat> i've been doing and i was a little bit skeptical in the beginning was my coach has been giving me some running drills and like for a long time i've sort of been um in the thought of mind that running should be a little bit more fluid and like everyone sort of got their style there's not like a one size fits all mold when it comes to running technique or running form but my coach has prescribed some running drills and instead of um, maybe detracting from my natural running thing and sort of just like taking the things that make me a good runner and like enhance them or makes them better. Um, so that's been something fun that we've incorporated. And um, yeah, maybe just like that. whether it helps or not, it's also something just kind of fun and different. It's important too right now. Yeah. I, um, I wouldn't typically do this during my season, but like once a week I try to ride with Justin when he has like kind of a hard ride and I just sit on his wheel and kind of go pretty hard and not worrying about, you know, having to run off the bike that day or um, I kind of don't even look at my garment. I just ride on Justin's wheel. That's the focus for the day. And that's been kind of fun and different. So I think to mix it up and, and maybe – if you can train with someone, I don't know, <laughs> social distancing. They sort of got to be your partner. But. <laughs> yeah, that's just been a, a fun thing for me. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I actually uh, am curious myself, what does a normal uh, easy day and then a hard day look like in your guys' lives for uh, workouts and maybe recovery? So don't have to get in specifics and, you know, share, share the secrets behind the scenes and everything. But what is a difference between what you'd consider like an easy day? What does that routine look like? Then what does a hard day look like for both of you? Um, well, I'll, Mondays are typically our easy day. Um, usually we're just like either have a swim and some mobility. But now that we're not swimming, we've just been having like a super easy spin. So maybe just on our road bikes and we just like kind of go on roads we've never been on before and just take it easy. Um, and yeah, Mondays we do a lot of like mobility and foam rolling and um, just kind of low stress day, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, for sure. That's like a good day to like get our errands done. Jeannie and I, like if we're talking about now, it's sort of like a, a different, it's a different time. I think if we're talking more normally, like Jeannie and I's training programs are actually quite different. Like mm -hmm. uh, my program is very consistent when it comes to overload so like i'll maybe get like an easy or like we call it like a flex monday where yeah i've got maybe like an easy ride or i'll go and do like a moderate swim or maybe both of those and then always do some gym mobility but then tuesday through sunday like i'm doing at least one session hard every day so i'm not really doing like three big sessions on on one day and then like having a full day easy it's more so like okay what's the key session for the day nail that and then there's like some typically some supplementary sessions around that where i'd say your program is probably a little bit more like 
Yeah, I'd have like a, a really big day. Like I would have a swim, a five hour ride with super hard intervals and then a run off the bike depending on where I am in a training block um, and probably gym on that day. So that would be a super hard day. And then the next day would be like off. Or yeah, or like two days sort of similar to that and then um, or like a double run day after that and then an easier day at that time. Awesome. Yeah, I, you know, I get tired just hearing about that. It seems like it's uh, very, very exhausting, but very, very rewarding come, you know, the, the end of stuff. Like, we talk about this all the time. And like, all these coaches who are coaching at a high level, like Jeannie works with Jesse Nikki. I work with Julie Dibbins and Matt Bottrell. Like, these are all the cream of the crop, top 1% of coaches. And we're all sort of doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, little bit of a different approach but like we've got more or less the same weekly hours we've got more or less the same weekly tss our ctl on race day is about the same if we're talking about specific training peaks metrics or whatever so mm -hmm. there's multiple ways to skin a cat it's just a matter of like finding the right fit for you in terms of mental physical whatever you know yeah absolutely um cool well we're gonna wrap up uh here the last thing i want to ask you is where can people find out more information about you guys specifically, any social media or websites or any other sponsors you want to plug? Uh, well, I think our biggest platform is the gram. So I'm little mates and Justin's big mates. Big mates try for me. Big mates try, pardon yeah. me, <laughs> yeah. no, on Instagram. Yeah. So you can find us there. We're pretty responsive um, on there the most you have. Nice yeah, I just sort of like put together yeah. a little website now, like uh, bigmetstry.com. You can go there and like check out stuff about our sponsors, coaching. Like we said earlier, when it comes to the sponsors, like we try to be really engaging with our community. Like we're not trapped on celebrities by any means. So like you can send us a DM. You can ask us. I can guarantee <laughs> I'll send you a reply. Uh, if you got questions about stuff or any topics that we covered here, like feel, feel free to DM me, send me an email, whatever. And we'll just try and be really responsive because we more than anything right now want to be helpful in the multi-sport community, whether you're a triathlete or a runner. Um, I know it's a tough time for everyone. So just know that like, um, even if the professional athletes seem unapproachable, like, we're all in the same boat. And I think a lot of us, whether it's Jeannie and I or anyone else, we'd be more responsive than you think when it comes to chatting or answering questions or whatever. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll uh, we'll put those links in the description here for anybody uh, listening to the podcast form of this as well as watching the video. So uh, I want to thank you guys again so much for coming on. We really do appreciate it. We wish you the best of luck uh, as we get back to the races, fingers crossed, knock on wood, um, all that stuff. You guys are set up for a ton of success. So we're really excited to chat with you uh, today. And this wraps up this Stride for the Love of Running series. We will uh, be back with another episode shortly. But for now, thanks again, Justin and Jeannie.